I start with traffic modeling and smart traffic control, if you don't mind. Um, so I've been working a lot on modeling traffic flows. And in fact, it's a pretty interesting phenomenon because some unexpected things happen in traffic flows. Have a look at this. So it's not a difficult task to drive in a circle, you would think. But it turns out that a traffic jam happens spontaneously. We call this a phantom traffic jam. And the question is, why is this happening? <laughs> if you would ask people, they would probably say, there was a stupid driver in front of me. But everyone would say that. So, you know, then probably would all be stupid. And now the question is, what's really going on? And there's some mathematics that tells us that above a certain density, the slightest variation in velocities would be amplified. So the next car will break, but it will break a little late, takes some time, delay it. And in order to compensate for this, the driver will have to tip the brake a little bit harder. And the next one even harder, and so on. So there's a chain reaction, and in the end, everyone gets stopped, although nobody wants this to happen. This is an example for systemic instability. So there are these kinds of systems. If you operate them in the wrong parameter regime or if they're wrongly designed, then no matter how well intended people are and how hard they are trying and how much data they have and what technology they're using, the system might still get out of control. Now, interestingly enough, um, traffic becomes unstable in the point that economists would call efficient. It means the highest throughput point. And what happens then is the so-called capacity drop. That means the very same road has 30% less capacity than it had before. It cannot transport as many vehicles any longer. And this happens exactly at a time where you need all your capacity uh, during the rush hour. You know, that's a very bad situation, so you would really like to stay up here as long as possible. What makes things even more complicated is it's not just these phantom traffic jams that exist, but also many more different congestion patterns. <coughs> and in the meantime, however, we do understand what these congestion patterns are and what are conditions under which they occur. And we can also pretty well predict the delay times caused by congestion patterns. <coughs> So for example, some years ago, I was um, involved in a project by a company that, that was called DDG. At that time, that was bought by T-Traffic, and they wanted to have a travel time prediction for the entire uh, German freeway system. And uh, we basically developed a simulation component that was fed by cross-sectional measurement data and by some floating car data too. And we were using a fluid dynamic model in order to kind of complement the measurement data because you cannot do measurements everywhere, it would just be too expensive. And so we used a model to fill this gap. And as a consequence, the predictions uh, improved a lot and delay times were reduced and delay times between the occurrence of congestion and the reporting of a congestion were also uh, reduced a lot. Now I was then working with Volkswagen on a project and was developing a traffic assistance system. Now we are here simulating these annoying stop and go waves that I've shown you before in the experiment, and we would like to get rid of them. Uh, how to do this? Now, first of all, we need to understand what's the problem. And so we will basically move out of the car, uh, elevate ourselves to get an overview, 
And then what we see is that there is an on-ramp and a few vehicles are trying to squeeze themselves into the freeway that produces small perturbations or disruptions and, and these are amplified and then it causes stop and go traffic. Now, suppose you would equip every car with a radar sensor that measures distances and relative velocities. Now, we could drive the cars automatically. We did that already 10 years ago and nobody was talking about Google self-driving cars. And as you can see, this allows to get rid of the traffic jam, even though the inflow stays the same in our simulation. Right, so what did we do? We changed the interaction between cars by real-time feedback in a way that stabilized the flow and increased the capacity. So we can fill some of the capacity gaps that happen. And uh, this is actually not just a theoretical concept, you know, uh, Volkswagen actually tested it in vehicles and it was pretty impressive, I would say. Another project we did together with Volkswagen is this extended level of service concept. So traditionally, level of service has been measured based on traffic densities. But this is not enough because there are other things that drivers care about like delay times, and delay times might actually increase dramatically when there is some congestion. So even small gaps in, in required capacity would uh, increase double times sometimes by a factor of two, five, or even 10. Another thing that people care about is fuel consumption. And again, another thing is they have to accelerate and decelerate a lot. So we can measure this and in this way define a new index. Um, this is extended, um, extended level of service concept. And in this way, we can basically map the level of service in the city and that's a good uh, precondition, very good to improve the system. We would certainly like to know this, and the drivers would like to know this, because then they would, of course, take the route that's the most comfortable for them. Traffic light control, that's maybe the most exciting project I've been working on. It's also the most complicated one, because the traffic in the city is really complex because you have counter traffic, you have delay times, uh, you have congestion, crossing flows, and everything that can make the life of a mathematician or a physicist or scientist of any kind, a traffic engineer, can make it difficult. You know, it's there in this kind of system. It's uh, so difficult to imagine what's going on. And I would say, okay, can we use self-organization to let the kind of order we would like to have in the system happen by itself? If you would just find the right kind of interaction between the traffic flows, just, <laughs> uh, we could just find the right kind of interaction. Basically, the smooth flows would be result by themselves. And to be even more ambitious, uh, we said, okay, we want to have a system which is not just working under idealized conditions like a Manhattan network, a square network. Of course, in many cases, at least in Germany and other European countries, you will have these kind of situations, um, intersections of uh, with four, three, four, five, six, seven, roads coming in you know and all sorts of messy situations and then would be building sites here and there all the time so there's always something happening and there are accidents too and there are special events and so the question is how do we deal with it because classically you would like to optimize traffic lights in real time 
unfortunately, this doesn't work. There are too many variables that you can change, like the order of green times at a different intersection, the, the length of the green times, the, the delay between the intersections, and you can do that for every single intersection. So there are really billions of parameters that you can change. This is just too much. You cannot do this in real time. And then what people have done is they said, okay, can we just operate it in a cyclical way, periodic, and then basically synchronize these cycles? And that sounds very plausible in our perfect plan, it seems. In reality, it turns out it's just throwing away a lot of solutions that would produce much better flows. So in order to compensate for this, what you try to do is to adjust your periodic traffic light schedule to the time of the day and to the day of the week, and uh, you would adapt it to the typical traffic flows, you know, the average over Monday mornings between 10 and 11, or Friday afternoon between 4 and 5, and then basically you produce an optimal traffic light control offline for that kind of situation, and then at that time of the day, and that weekday, you take it out of your folder, basically you apply it. The problem is, however, that real traffic flow does not behave like the typical average traffic flow. The variability of the number of cars waiting behind your red light is as large as your average. The number of cars turning right is changing every single minute. So there's just too much randomness in the process. And it, as a result, you're applying an optimal traffic light schedule for a situation that never occurs. And that means it's not optimal. Sorry to say that. And what then some more advanced traffic light control schemes are doing is they're adapting the green times. They usually stay within the optimized cycles, but then if there are fewer cars, they would shorten the green times. If there are more cars, they would extend them. But you don't vary everything that could be changed. Uh, this, this would be the adaptive traffic light systems, uh, kind of state-of-the-art systems, but still you're not taking into account all possible solutions. And it turns out uh, that the interesting solutions are not among them. Because you need to be more flexible. You know? If the traffic is partly predictable, and it's varying a lot, then the best you can do is to have a flexible adaptive traffic light control. And this is what we have been working on. And we have been inspired by pedestrian flows, I'll come back to this later. At uh, bottlenecks, there are passing the bottlenecks in an oscillatory way. And it looks like there would be a pedestrian traffic light, but there is not. So it's just based on pressure that's building up in the crowd. And we were thinking we couldn't use this to define a traffic light. So then basically the traffic flows define the, or control the traffic lights rather than the other way around, you could say. So it's a completely different principle. And uh, in fact, uh, it's causing synchronized patterns in the city, and it's causing green waves, as I've shown you before. So that's interesting. Uh, we were just applying a self-organization approach to, to reach a coordinated flow. And then uh, once we had done this, uh, we got in touch with uh, Transportation Authority in Dresden. That was the city where I was working as a professor at that time. And I said, okay, there is an area that we are not happy with, which is in the center of Dresden. There is a railway station. I see a pretty 
irregular messy road system. And what they wanted to do is to prioritize public transportation, buses and trams. And you'll see there are a lot of them. On the other hand, they couldn't do this because giving priority to a tram or a bus when they arrive at an intersection means you would interrupt the green waves that had been designed for the cars. And it would disturb the car traffic so much that it would cause a monster congestion within a very short time. Yeah? So this, they were buying into a state-of-the-art traffic control that's a greenway-based and adaptive. And it was probably pretty expensive, but still they were not happy because they couldn't prioritize public transportation. So this is the area we are talking about. And these are the different trams and buses that go through the area. So you can see these are many different lines and a lot of disruptions that are caused by public transportation if you want to prioritize. And we have actually then applied our approach to the same kind of measurement data that had been used uh, to operate the system over here. So these are empirical measurements. And so these two scenarios should be comparable. And this is what they're doing now, and this is what we propose. You can see the trams are going earlier and it doesn't look so congested, right? Now you could say maybe this is just because you've been cutting out this part that looks good. Yeah? I mean, if I was a company salesman, I would probably do such a thing, uh, but I'm a scientist. And so we have been looking into the statistical features and measuring the advantages. Now, this is how it's operated today. You can clearly see the green wave bands, right? So they're basically queuing up a lot of vehicles over here. And once they have enough vehicles, they send them all in a short time green band uh, through several intersections. Now this is how it uh, would work with our adaptive traffic light control. You see there are also green wave bands, but they're not periodic, yeah? And they're shorter. And the advantage of this is you can use gaps that happen to open up in the crossing traffic flow. So you're using the opportunities that are there. You just have to be flexible enough. And so let's see how that actually performs as compared to what's going on today. So gray is what's going on today and blue or violet is the situation that would come out with our new adaptive flexible traffic light control. You can see that there are dramatic improvement for public transportation. So prioritization works, um, but it's not at the cost of individualized car traffic. There's even some improvement for them. And there's a large improvement uh, for pedestrian societies too. Now there are further advantages. In fact, travel times become more predictable. So you don't have to waste say 50 minutes extra to, to be sure to be on time and it's also good for the environment yeah because altogether you don't have to stop so much and you're not uh, uh, wasting so much time now we can look a little bit more into this because it's pretty interesting what's the functional principle so this is what we have today a central control Traffic center is collecting information from all over the city and then it's trying to do the best thing it can do and implementing this in the entire city. Yeah, we could call that the benevolent dictator. And someone who decides what needs to be done and is trying to do it as good as possible. Yeah? 
So we assume that nobody could do it better than this. So I mean, we have the most powerful technology that's around in the world. Yeah? But still, the optimization problem is so-called anti-hard. I mean, even all the computer power in the world is not enough to do it in real time. Now there's another approach. We could say, okay, why don't we let each intersection separately optimize travel time? So all the cars driving towards this intersection will be taken into account. You strictly minimize travel times. And there are mathematical formulas how to do this. So mathematically, it's not complicated to do this. But we could call that uh, a homo economicus approach because in each intersection is just doing what's best from the perspective of each intersection. Yeah, everyone is doing the best, um, but separately from each other. And then there's a third approach that does the same thing with one little difference. When a queue grows large, we would first clear it before we go back to travel time minimization. And we'll see the advantage is that it wouldn't cause spillover effects. Because once a queue grows up to the next intersection, it would cause a disruption over there and uh, congestion would quickly spreading would be quickly spreading all over the area. So we can understand that clearing the queues can be positive. And we call this other regarding because this intersection would take into account what happens to the neighboring intersection. Yeah. So let's see how they perform. The top down optimization approach is represented by the red curve. Q lengths of vehicles as a function of capacity utilization of the intersection. Um, so clearly, as we have more traffic, uh, there are longer queues. That's what we expect, yeah? So that looks like a reasonable behavior here. And now let's compare that uh, with the selfish optimization, the homo economicus approach. And each intersection separately tries to do the best it can do. And we see, wow, that's much better actually. So uh, queue lengths are much shorter, but suddenly it's exploding. Yeah, and so we can say here, kind of this invisible hand kind of phenomenon works. Traffic flows are coordinating themselves like magic. And here the coordination breaks down and basically invisible hand doesn't work, yeah? Now this is interesting. And then of course the traffic center says, see, that's why you need us. And, uh, <laughs> and in fact, it's true, right? But there is an even smarter solution. And this is the other regarding optimization. It's still a local optimization approach, but it takes care of the interaction with the neighboring intersection of the external effects or externalities, as economists would say. I can say this is better than all over the way. So it's kind of the best approach because it flexibly adapts to the local needs. And this makes the invisible hand work. So basically with the right kind of information, real-time information and real-time feedback, we can operate the same system in a better way. Now, as I said already before, self condensation happens in pedestrian flows too, and that was actually the source of this inspiration. So usually, uh, I need to start it manually, I guess. You can find this phenomenon basically everywhere in the world. A separation of the different flow direction in lanes. This separation happens automatically. I don't need a law for it, or a policeman, or a sign. And people are not even aware of it usually. So it just happens. I uh, don't have to plan this. Uh, it's just based on the interactions between the different flow directions and creates a smooth flow usually. Uh, there are some 
one complication, though, that in some countries people have a preference for the right hand side, in other countries they have a preference for the left hand side. And sometimes you have international events, and suddenly you have both <laughs> types of people, and, and then your capacities may not be enough if you have planned for everyone going on the same side. A similar and even more interesting phenomenon happens if you have two crossing flows. Uh, it's almost like magic because when these stripes are forming, it allows people to cross the flow without even stopping. It's really, again, like magic. So how does it happen? Well, these stripes are moving forward and people can move sidewards in the stripe, so together they just keep moving and get through this other trap. Uh, we have done an experiment, we should show you a movie, but there's not so much time, so I'm showing you this, which I mentioned already before, this oscillatory flow at bottlenecks. So, this is just a simple force model and uh, it describes these funny oscillations that we have basically learned from to create this self realizing traffic flow control. Now, shockingly enough, these self realized pattern of motion imply that all our pedestrian designs are wrong. Of course, our classical pedestrian facilities are made up of three elements, corridors, bottlenecks, intersections, right? What else is there? Um, now for the bottlenecks, you could do this. Uh, you take away some space and you create a funnel and you can easily imagine that's better than that. Yeah? wouldn't have disruptions by people who end up in these corners and need to get in the flow again. So, but that's interesting because less is more. Taking away space can improve your situation. Uh, you wouldn't think this. And once you have understood this, you would ask, okay, can I take away space in the corridor and improve the flow? And in fact, it's possible, <laughs> believe it or not. So. I observed that in Hungary in a metro station where they have these pillars for static reasons. Right? But look what happens. It, uh, it's pretty adaptive. Now people arrive over here and after a short time they're using 50% of the space on this side basically for that flow direction and the other side for that flow direction. Yeah, and pretty fluent, it works well. And the pillars basically stabilize the flow at the interface between the different flow directions. And you could think about intersections too. And if you have an intersection of four flow directions, you just get a pretty chaotic situation in the center. However, if you have two crossing flows, you can have the stripe formation phenomena. Right, that creates some order. So the idea was to basically subdivide an intersection of four crossing flow directions into four intersections of two crossing flows. And then you get a circular flow. I guess that people in Singapore are mostly working on the left hand side of this, correct? Then this, this is the European design, you would have to do it the other way around. So, let me see, maybe I, I even have... No, I cut out this, this one slide, but anyway. Crowd disasters, yeah, so sometimes things go terribly wrong. And while under normal conditions, you would have uh, the, this uh, lane formation phenomena, when the density is too high, you might end up in a crowd disaster. Coordination breaks down. Yeah. And here are some examples. This was in South Africa. You can see people are 
storming forward, the steer barrier is broken, even brick walls could be broken uh, by a crowd of people. This is a situation where people are trying to get out of an emergency exit, but there is a clogging effect, nobody gets out, policemen can, can do nothing. So that's terrible. That's like having no emergency exit or even worse. <clears throat> I don't know where that happened, but uh, we'll see a domino effect. So thousands of people are falling and that was a disaster in the Heisel Stadium in Belgium. I can see that people are piled up on top of each other. And it's very difficult to, to, to pull people out of the seat. And people on the bottom would not be able to breathe for a long time, so they would die. Now, I was asked to help improve Muslim pilgrimage in Mecca because there has been many crowd disasters too in the past. So this is Mecca and the Holy Mosque. This is Mina a few kilometers away. This is the 10th city for 1.5 million pilgrims. There is another 1.5 million pilgrims that nobody knows exactly where they are, but that they are somewhere. And all of them want to perform this Stoning the Devil ritual at the Dram Bridge. That was the old one. So basically, the pillars represent the devil, or to be more specific, the temptation by the devil. And of course, you res should demonstrate that you resist this temptation. So to demonstrate this, you throw small stones against this pillar. But if um, several million people are doing this on the same day in the same place, then it gets pretty crowded, right? And that caused all these crowd disasters. One of those crowd disasters happened in the beginning of 2006 in the open plaza. That was the old Jamarad Bridge. This is 40 meters entrance, 80 meters here. So you would think there is a bottleneck problem. But in fact, there was. So a few analyzed the flow of people, and it happened to be a surveillance camera here. So was possible to analyze what happened and how and why. You can see that flows were coming together from different directions and that effectively created a bottleneck. And as a result, there was a surprising phenomena happening um, that pedestrian researchers didn't expect to occur. So in the beginning, you have a smooth laminar flow. And then, after some time, we'll see it in a few seconds, there is a sudden transition to stop and go waves. So we learned a lot from the analysis of this. I think you can see it. And then, I think altogether, for about 30 minutes, did we see the stop and go waves. And then there happened another sudden transition to a phenomenon that we called crowd turbulence. And in this phenomenon, people are pushed into all possible directions. And it turns out this happens um, when the density is so high that basically everyone is squeezed in between others. So this is the transition from smooth flow to stop and go flow. A better video over here. And this is the crowd turbulence um, which finally killed people, right? Because you're pushed around some people will lose their balance, will stumble, fall on the ground. It creates a hole in the crowd. 
this breaks the balance of forces a lot of people fall on top and uh, then you have this terrible course of events that causes the crash disaster so to avoid such kind of crowd disasters from happening in the future, a lot of things were done and hopefully this is enough uh, to keep the place safe for a long time. Now the number of pilgrims is increasing every year though, so it's, it's hard to say what's going to happen in the future. But what they did is add additional level to have more capacity, um, have elliptically shaped uh, pillars, to have more capacity for the stony ritual. Separate flow directions from each other and uh, people coming from different areas were separated through these vans. Um, have a unidirectional flow organization. People coming to the Jamra Bridge use different routes compared to those going back. And come up with signage, information and awareness programs, and then a lot of other things. A control tower was put in place where all the responsible ministries and military and, uh, and first aid and so on was uh, in one building and could talk to each other. Um, Surveillance cameras were post process to figure out what was the capacity utilization of the different roads. In case it was high, there was a rerouting strategy to have people use another road so it would avoid overuse of capacity. And there was also a scheduling program to make sure that not everyone would go at the same time. So everyone had a certain time to leave. And that created a situation that changed from this to that. So uh, in earlier years, emergency vehicles had hard times to get towards the people in need. And then everything was well organized later on and pilgrims liked it so the overall principle is we were taking out friction from the system through counter flows and crossing flows and all these kind of things so it would take less time to go from the pilgrim camps to the Jamra bridge and back and spending less time in the system means less congestion so it caused an overall improvement for everyone okay so finally uh, a project that I'm now working on is the planetary nervous system and it's going to use the internet of things uh, to measure basically everything that we could think of. You know, in many situations, in order to improve the system, we would need to have more information and in particular, real-time information. If you want to kind of have real-time feedback and to help the system to self-organize and coordinate itself, you know, real-time information is really key. So, the Internet of Things is really a new opportunity. In about 10 years' time, there will be 150 billion sensors in the world. That means um, between 10 and 20 per person. In fact, in a single smartphone, there are 15 of them. And that means you'll be able to measure a lot of things in the world. Um, it's possible to create a map of the world from this. And even with the pictures that people take, like tourists you know, that are going, walking through the city, you can reconstruct a 3D picture of the world. As it has been done over here for the Coliseum in Rome, you can do this in principle from your desk at home or at work and this information is out there already. Other information is not yet out there but we could produce it if we open up the centers of our smartphones. In this way we could create new compasses for decision makers to measure all sorts of things, not just GDP, per capita productivity as a function of space and time but also 
house, environment, education, happiness, whatever comes to your mind. I've shown this already. Um, so real-time feedback is really key for these self-regulating systems. And another thing that we might be able to do is to create collective intelligence. Of course, the problems are becoming more and more complex, so we need to have more intelligence to solve it. And we could create something like combinatorial intelligence. That's the idea. So bring the best ideas of many minds together. Now, if we imagine to open up our smartphone sensors, we would certainly only want to do this if we can trust this information system. You know, you were mentioning privacy concerns before. Um, we do have such concerns too. And therefore, we believe it's important to have something like open personal data store, as it has been developed by the MIT. And the idea is that whenever information is created about somebody, it would be sent to a personal data mailbox. And you could administer this mailbox and say, this kind of data I'm happy to share with companies because I want to get personalized offers, personalized products or services. But my health data, I just want to share with my doctor and my social data, I just want to share with my friends or whatever you feel easy about, you know. And maybe you, you would say, but I don't want to share any data at all. Okay, I mean, I personally can respect this, yeah. But this would be your control center and the success principle of the pension nervous system would be participation, yeah. So you would want to use some data for your own purposes. And for this to work, you would have to give some data back. Otherwise, of course, it can't work, right? Should be a fair deal. Uh, but also, it wouldn't be a classical app as you can have it on your smartphone today, which is usually a walled garden. So it can do a few things. But that's it. You cannot connect the different apps with each other. You cannot do what you want. And that will be different here. As a participatory system, you know, we would build on your own ideas and creativity to use these sender data and also to contribute your source codes that would, uh, you would develop uh, to use this data back to the community of users here. So open data, open innovation is kind of a major underlying principle. So it would create opportunities for everyone, for users, customers, uh, citizens, uh, for politicians, for uh, business people, for scientists, and as I said, for every single person. And I believe that information is a precondition for coordination and coordination is a precondition for systems to work well. So this would enable people to create better products, better services, better neighborhoods, better workplaces, better cities, you know, smart cities, smart societies, smart nations. Yeah? This is the idea. And with a micropayment system, we could even use that to create own businesses, a consultancy or uh, data services or products even uh, with 3D printers or whatever comes through your mind. You can use that as you want to use it. And in this way, I believe it would create a lot of these jobs that will be lacking in the future. So as I said, uh, about 50, percent of jobs have to be created anew in the digital sector and that needs to have a basis and the basis needs to be data of course and this is how we would produce the data and you could make business with this data but at the same time there would be this principle of sharing and in this way an information and innovation and production ecosystem would develop where whatever people do, 
allows other people to do something with that. And again, what you're doing with this can be used by other people. So it creates more and more possibilities, more and more jobs, more and more business. And this is the entire idea. And I sometimes actually co compare this with a rich rainforest, you know? Because the, the rainforest has basically resources for everyone, you know? It, uh, it's full of opportunities for all sorts of species. And it works because it's basically a network. An ecological system is like a network. And there's a lot of exchange of resources in this network. So my proposal is therefore to build this as a participatory citizen web to create these opportunities for everyone. And we have started to build it, it's called NervousNet. And I'm here in Singapore actually to try to convince you and colleagues that uh, we should all together build this NervousNet to create these opportunities for everyone in the future. Thank you very much.